Occasionally, I'll come across a movie I'd enjoyed as a kid, but hadn't seen for years. While popular on cable TV at the time, such films may never have hit a nerve with audiences to make it rise to the level of an 80s classic, so it won't re-enter my entertainment radar until decades later. Which was the case with the 1981 Chevy Chase film, Modern Problems. From what I could remember, the storyline was like any modern superhero film. An awkward man pines for a girl he can't have until he somehow comes into possession of superhuman abilities. He has trouble mastering them at first, before eventually learning to use them responsibly and getting the girl. Then I watched it for the first time as an adult, and could see why this was the kind of film you had to be a kid in the 1980s to be able to enjoy. Modern Problems is ostensibly a comedy written and directed by Ken Shapiro a former child star turned writer-director who went on to do nothing else after Modern Problems. The film was a moderate success, grossing $26 million off an $8 million budget and the 28th most profitable production of the year, so it's not like writing or directing it should have killed Shapiro's career. It seems he simply quit Hollywood, although maybe it's not a coincidence that his retirement happened shortly after working with Chevy Chase. Chase plays Max Fiedler, a depressed air traffic controller who is also, and this may be difficult to believe for a character played by Chevy Chase, somewhat clumsy and bumbling. Shortly after his girlfriend dumps him, a truck hauling nuclear waste dumps him as well. Or rather, dumps a load of green goo on him as he follows behind in traffic. Instead of turning him into the guy at the end of a Robocop, the nuclear waste gives Max a superpower. Telekinesis. While afraid of his new ability at first, it doesn't take long for Max to embrace his power, which he mostly uses to get revenge against anyone he feels wronged him. Eventually, like many stories involving the sudden emergence of superpowers, Max's telekinesis starts to overwhelm him, putting his life and the lives of those around him in jeopardy. This plotline was a staple for a lot of late 1970s and 80s cinema, but unlike most of the protagonists in those films, Chevy Chase is just a terrible human being. His character in Modern Problems is awful as well. Got any tuna? Right I don't you, know. This is Air France inbound from Tunis, coming in at 325. 350. Hold there, France. 350 for tuna? Copy your correction. Coming in at 350 from Tunis. Not you, Tunis. Maintain 325. The audience is clearly meant to sympathize with him. Max has a stressful job as an air traffic controller during the Reagan years, which was not a good time to be in that particular profession. He has car problems. He's clumsy. He lives in a cramped apartment. These are fairly typical ways to get an audience immediately on the side of the protagonist because many of us have lousy jobs, drive broken down cars, are awkward, and live in crappy houses. It's when his girlfriend leaves him that we start to get a better idea of just what kind of man Max is, and he is far from sympathetic. Early exposition is delivered here via answering machine. Remember those? Hi Darcy, it's Max. I'll be home at 6, and uh, to make up for that argument last night, I'll take us both out to a nice dinner at Dubrovnik's. Okay? Bye, hon. Max, it's, it's Darcy. By now, you've probably noticed I've moved out, and this time I've really had it. I just can't live with your crazy jealousy anymore. Paying waiters to spy on me at business lunches, calling my mother if I don't get home by 7.30, and today I find a radio check bugging device in my purse. I just can't understand why you won't trust me. Goodbye. First, we hear Max apologize to his girlfriend, Darcy, for an argument they had the night before, apparently bad enough for him to want to make up for it by taking her out to dinner. This is followed by a message she leaves for Max, breaking up with him. Right after finding out she left him, the very first thing Max does is to check the box holding her contraceptive presumably to see if she took it with her and is thus sleeping with someone else. 
I can't tell if the point of this scene is that she took her diaphragm with her or is still wearing it. If she took it with her, she would have left it in the package because you don't just toss your diaphragm by itself in your purse with your keys and lip gloss. If she's wearing it, she either had sex within the last 6 hours or was planning on having sex within the next 24. If she and Max had an argument the night before, it's not likely she had sex with him then. But her later actions show she wasn't cheating, so she clearly wasn't planning on having sex with anyone else either. Obviously, the scene is here to make Max appear justified in being suspicious of her, but when given any thought, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Which is a bit of a running theme throughout Modern Problems. Pining for Darcy, Max goes to a restaurant where he almost immediately starts flirting with a strange woman. Remember, his girlfriend just left him and the entire movie is based on Max's attempts to get her back, but here he is buying a drink for a woman he's probably never even seen before. The only reason Max doesn't end up sleeping with her is because the restaurant patrons suddenly engage in an inexplicable round robin of couples flirting with other couples, causing Max to leave in disgust. This scene took almost three minutes of runtime and doesn't make a lot of sense. On his way home, Max sees a mannequin in a storefront and in a very creepy manner pledges to be a better boyfriend to it specifically promising to control himself and trust her. It's obvious the mannequin is supposed to be a stand-in for Darcy, but the audience hasn't actually seen her yet and thus shouldn't have any idea what the hell possessed him to kiss that window. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Arriving home, he's surprised to find Darcy, played by Patty Darbanville, waiting for him. She says she felt guilty only leaving a voice message dumping him and wanted to see him in person and that despite everything that happened, she still loves him. It's clear she's trying to give Max a chance here, but he blows it of course. The next day, Max is riding his bike with his ex-wife Lorraine, played by Mary Kay Place. The purpose of this scene is both exposition explaining Max's jealous and controlling, which we already knew from him already admitting that in a previous scene, as well as to illustrate that he's such a lovable guy that even his ex-wife still enjoys his company. The two run into an old friend of Max's from high school, Brian, played by the always awesome Brian Doyle Murray, and his housekeeper slash nanny slash Haitian stereotype, Dorita, played by Nell Carter. Brian is a wheelchair-bound Vietnam vet who runs a publishing house and invites Max and Lorraine to a press party he's holding later that evening. By the way, those are some short shorts. We wear short shorts. If you dare wear short shorts. The party is held in a gay nightclub, which allows for the typical 1980s gay panic scenes featuring the usual gay cliches like shirtless muscle men, cowboys, porn stashes, Truma Capote, Catholic priests, and... Colonel Sanders? While there, Max happens to run into Darcy, accompanied by her friend Barry, who, speaking of Colonel Sanders, is played by a guy who isn't but looks a lot like George Weiner from Spaceballs. Barry is a theatrical producer who says he invited Darcy because he's a fan of the writer being celebrated that evening, but as Max explains to Lorraine, Barry always seems to show up whenever their relationship is in trouble and is clearly trying to put the moves on Darcy. While this dialogue is meant to explain Max's mistrust of Barry's intentions, it also serves to illustrate that Max and Darcy's relationship is so troubled they routinely go through enough rough patches that a friend of hers is able to make it a habit to intrude. Oh shoot, what a ball buster. There's an odd moment here where Lorraine obviously says shit, but for some reason they ADR'd the word shoot in its place. Modern Problems was rated PG in the days before PG-13, meaning it was much more adult than modern films with that same rating. There are even a few bits of brief nudity later, as well as some drug references. So why they would censor such minor swearing here doesn't make a lot of sense. The party's guest of honor, self-help author Mark Winslow, played by the 1980s favorite sleazy character actor Dabby Coleman, overhears Max's dilemma and rudely offers his advice. Well, his girlfriend moved out on him yesterday and mm -hmm. she took everything in the apartment and now she's here with some guy. 
That's fair enough. She wanted it, she took it, he let her. How do you feel about it, Max? Well, I don't know. Uh... See, I would hope you'd come to the healthy conclusion she's a manipulating bitch. Oh, I don't think that's necessary. You have to understand life sucks, so why not be a schmuck? You see, we haven't really uh, broken up yet. Uh... It sounds to me like this gal's about to hand your butt to her rearview mirror. While he's clearly meant to be a raging asshole here, and apart from accusing Darcy of being a manipulating bitch, his advice is actually reasonable. Darcy did leave Max and is out with another man, so she's clearly considering making it a permanent breakup. Depressed, Max leaves the party and on his way home, gets doused with nuclear waste by a truck possibly being driven by Captain Joseph Hazelwood. Afterward, Max fumbles his way into his apartment and then to bed, and even though he is glowing bright green, never notices anything amiss. In fact, he doesn't even shower after having strange chemicals dumped directly on his body from a waste truck, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. During breakfast the next morning, Max is terrified by his dishes seemingly moving on their own, followed by an earthquake in his kitchen. Later, he plays basketball with Brian and loses to the paraplegic. If this film was made nowadays, this would have been an empowering moment showing just how capable the differently abled are and how despite their disadvantage, can still compete with the fully abled. In this film, it's likely the scene is probably meant to be funny or show yet another example of how big a loser Max really is. Following the game, a worried Max confesses to Brian that he's seeing things move, but Brian assumes Max is just trashing his place over Darcy leaving him. You break things. I masturbate. So what? Same difference. Incidentally, Max and Brian are hanging out, playing basketball, and acting like best friends despite not having seen each other since high school. Max didn't even know that Brian was injured in the war. Their close relationship in this film doesn't make a lot of sense. Upon returning home, Max finally gets a shower. Since this is Chevy Chase, of course he can't even do that without finding a way to clumsily drop the soap into a poo-filled litter box. Remembering his early experience in the kitchen, Max tentatively flexes his new powers by floating the soap out of the box and washing it off in the sink. Pleased with his new discovery, he caresses the soap before finishing the shower. As I said, this film cost $8 million to produce, the equivalent of $20 million in today's money, but the special effects crew couldn't be bothered to prepare another piece of soap for the close-up shot and instead used the same prop used for the floating shot despite the clear holes drilled into the top of the wires. Max decides to have dinner at the restaurant from earlier and, oh for crying out loud, Japanese men with cameras strapped to their fronts, because of course, Max decides to have dinner at the restaurant, and would you know it, again he runs into Darcy and Barry. Barry tries to set Max's mind at ease that he's not interested in Darcy as anything but a friend and encourages Max to move on, but then he immediately stares at Darcy's ass as she leaves the table to use the restroom before smugly looking back at Max. In retaliation, Max gives Barry a nosebleed using his telekinesis. And not just a little one. He gives Barry a harem anime protagonist level of nosebleed. And while played for laughs, the amount of blood loss shown here is a legitimate medical emergency prompting a doctor to rush Barry to a hospital. Of course, by the time Darcy returns, the bloody mess has already been cleaned up by the waitstaff. Max joins Darcy at her table and tells her that Barry had to leave, even joking about a grown man needing a doctor for a nosebleed, like a goddamn sociopath. Max again pressures Darcy to come back to him, and she again declines. Seemingly admitting defeat, Max instead offers to get her a cab ride home, to which she agrees. During the walk outside, however, he once again begs her to return, and she once again rebuffs him. He asks why not, and Darcy explains she doesn't believe he'll ever change. Max, like almost literally every abusive partner in every toxic relationship ever, adamantly insists that he will change that he's already changed, and promises to make everything better, including not calling her at work or getting jealous if she has to go out with other men for her job. Eventually, Max wears Darcy down enough that she agrees to date him the following evening, 
but she does stress that she'll have to check if she already had any prior commitments. To which Max immediately replies, Commitments? I'm more important than any commitments. Like that isn't a red goddamn flag right there. Darcy, what are you doing? Get away from him! Finally, Max takes the hint and lets Darcy get into her cab, but not before turning what she obviously meant to be a friendly goodbye kiss on the cheek into a full-fledged lover's embrace. After an evening of a contrite Max promising to change and not call Darcy at work or get angry if she goes out with other men, literally the very next scene the following day finds Max calling Darcy at her job demanding to know why she hadn't called him yet. He then gets even more upset after she tells him she had forgotten about an earlier promise to Barry to attend a premiere that night of a new dancer of his. Max accuses Darcy of cheating despite her repeated assurances that Barry is just a friend and she needed his support the past few days. Max even accuses Darcy of lying to him about wanting to go out even though she said the night before that she couldn't remember if she already had any prior commitments. Commitments? I'm more important than any commitments. As Max vents on the phone, behind him, his telekinesis unknowingly causes an airplane-shaped ashtray to soar around the room before violently smashing into a wall in front of another air traffic controller who doesn't react with anything other than confusion, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. The scene is directed as if it's a comedic moment, but in actuality, it's a frightening window into the destructive and violent undercurrent of Max's psyche. That night at Barry's ballet premiere, he and Darcy are watching the performance from the balcony, while, unbeknownst to those two, a bitter Max is sitting in the crowd spying on them. As the star performer takes the stage, Max sees Barry holding Darcy's hand, and in retaliation, uses his powers to cause the dancer to trip and land in the orchestra pit. Despite what would otherwise be considered a serious accident, the dancer gamely returns to the stage to continue his performance, only for Max to cause him to fly impossibly high into the stage dressing. Disheveled and punch drunk, the dancer attempts one last time to salvage the show, and possibly his career, before Max causes his codpiece to inflate and explode. Remember, the dancer was just an innocent bystander that Max tortured and humiliated because he wanted to punish the ballet's producer, Barry, for putting the moves on his girlfriend. This scene was obviously intended to be funny, but the footage itself, with Chase's expressions and the uncomfortable close-ups on his face, looks like something from a serial killer movie. In fact, watch it again with a different soundtrack and you'll see what I mean. filmmaker's choice to frame the sequence this way doesn't make a lot of sense. After the ballet, a distraught Barry shares a cab with Darcy back to her place and tries yet again to upgrade their relationship to something more, but is firmly returned to the friend zone where he belongs. While opening the door to her apartment, she is surprised by Max, who, like the stalker he is, suddenly appears behind her. Acting on instinct, Darcy gives him the only conclusion to his character arc that he deserves. You know what? Let's watch that again. 
Unfortunately, the movie still has about 45 minutes of runtime left, so like the toxic, manipulative sociopath he is, Max is able to play on Darcy's sympathies to gain access back into her life. The scene switches immediately to bed where the two of them are having sex. Darcy isn't really into it, probably due to the lousy past few days, which were almost entirely Max's fault, and asks him to stop. I'm not finished yet. He whines that he isn't finished yet, and instead of leaving her alone, he uses his telekinesis to bring her to orgasm. Incidentally, this was my favorite scene as a 12-year-old boy in the days before the internet's easy access to sexual images. Speaking of sexual education, an important lesson this movie seems to want to impart is that having sex with an unwilling partner is just fine as long as you are able to make them come. Not content with just one psychic screwing, Max makes Darcy climax a few more times before becoming overcome either with a sense of shame or more jealousy because she enjoyed herself without it. Rather than allowing Darcy to simply enjoy herself, Max, once again, retreats into self-pity before Darcy, once again, soothes his ego and convinces him to spend the weekend with her at Brian's house by the sea. This is where modern problems really starts to go off the rails. Max and Darcy arrive at Brian's house, which, for some reason, is the Bates house from Psycho. And just in case you didn't get the joke, we get a single shot of the house in black and white, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. They're greeted by Lorraine, who in less than a week has already moved in with Brian, where they act like an old married couple. We are reintroduced to Dorita, who uses her voodoo priestess powers to predict a very bad weekend, punctuated by the nearby sound of thunder, despite the previous scene showing a clear blue sky. Ooh, wee! What is it? According to these chicken guts, there's going to be an awfully big ruckus here this weekend. Max and Darcy are shown to a comfortable guest room, only to be accosted by the newly arrived Winslow, who insists on taking the best room. Max quickly gives in and agrees to take Dorita's room instead. And since she's from Haiti, the room is filled with voodoo iconography, and according to the ever-polite Max... Smells like feet. Max? Once settled, Max declines Darcy's offer for a walk and instead remains in the room. While on the beach, Darcy runs into Winslow, who propositions her, which of course Max sees from the bedroom window. Incidentally, the only reason Winslow was on the beach in the first place seems to be so he would have a private place to dictate a partial list of his favorite things into a recorder. Which doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't understand why you cling to that poor distraught man up there. I mean, the man in his condition can't possibly maintain a stable relationship. I would... I would seriously hope you'd come to the healthy conclusion that he's a manipulating bastard. Winslow also gives Darcy almost the same advice he gave to Max earlier in the film, only this time Max is the manipulating bastard. I'm not sure if this is meant to show that he gives the same advice regardless of the circumstances, or if this is just his usual way to pick up partners who are in a bad relationship. If the latter, it might imply that he was hitting on Max earlier in the film, and the fact that he chose to have his press party in a gay nightclub might support that theory. The thing is though, while obviously a sleazy character the audience is meant to hate, Winslow is right. Max isn't stable, and he isn't capable of maintaining a healthy relationship, and his track record shows that yes, he really is a manipulating bastard. After a quick conversation with Dorita, who warns her that Max's aura is green with yellow spots, which from context must be... bad? Darcy returns to their bedroom. Max snaps at her regarding her talk with Winslow on the beach, but since she's used to his bullshit by now, she shrugs it off and playfully repeats what Dorita said about his aura. Panicking, Max immediately leaps up to look at himself in the mirror and to his horror, finds that he really is glowing green with yellow spots. Now, Darcy was only kidding, but Max still saw what she described, so either he's suggestible and hallucinating 
or his telekinesis allows him to see auras, which would imply that Dorita also has this ability since she claims to have seen what Max sees. Either way, this scene doesn't make a lot of sense. Right before heading down to dinner, Darcy is called into Winslow's bedroom where he again propositions her, although this time while nude. Again, Darcy rebukes him and leaves, but not before Max sees her exiting Winslow's room. The look on his face shows he's doubting her yet again, despite her only having left their bedroom literally less than two minutes ago, which unless you're a teenage boy, isn't nearly long enough to consummate an illicit liaison. At the table, Winslow is being his usual insufferable self, taking it in turn to insult each dinner guest under the guise of relationship advice. Eventually, he turns to Max and accuses him of faking an illness for attention. I believe you're totally bedged out. I'll tell you something else. I'm getting a little bit tired of you trying to be the center of attention vis-a-vis -vis that, uh, that phony illness of yours. It happens to be the oldest psychological ploy in the book, what we call the, the, the wounded duck syndrome. Help me, help me. Fix my broken wing. Well, Darcy, I don't know why you tolerate that wimp. Again, while Winslow is absolutely an asshole, he's not exactly wrong about Max constantly making himself the center of attention. Sure, Max is seriously messed up, but he doesn't seem to even want to try to put on a happy face to keep from ruining everyone else's weekend. This, however, is the final straw. Max has had enough, and he punishes Winslow by using his telekinesis to float the jerk around the room, slamming him into walls, and finally landing him face first into a bowl of mashed potatoes. While under Max's control, Winslow chatters nervously, including saying how glad he is that Darcy sees what Max is capable of because she could be next. You know, wait, hey, Darcy, I'm, I'm kind of glad you're witnessing all of this. You've got some kind of idea and a twisted mind you're dealing with here. Oh, 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 oh. you know, violence is the last resort of a limited mind. I hope you realize it's good for you, Dawson. Again, he's an asshole, but he's right. Max is jealous, unstable, and violent, and Darcy is absolutely in danger the longer she stays with him. Just look at how Max stares at Darcy after assaulting Winslow. That is creepy as hell. Humiliated, Winslow storms out of the house and purposely heads to the sea, clearly intending to toss himself in. Lorraine arrives and tries talking him out of suicide by reminding him how much Winslow loves himself, but is only able to stop him after bringing up his new Porsche. This doesn't make a lot of sense. If anything, those arguments should have been reversed because Winslow's character is almost entirely defined by how much he loves himself, and that should have been what convinced him not to take his own life. Darcy, meanwhile, finds Max floating in their bedroom in a scene clearly evoking the exorcist. She convinces Dorita to use her voodoo priestess powers to help, despite the latter's initial and insultingly racist refusal. Will you read my lips? No. N-O-E. Dorita does her best, including trying to create a binding circle for the demon possessing Max, but in the only real iconic scene from the entire movie, Max instead recreates what happened 20 minutes before every episode of Saturday Night Live when Chase was in the cast. Winslow then appears and fires a pistol at Max, who easily stops the bullet before sending the author headfirst into the ceiling. This could easily have broken his neck, but I'll give Max this one since Winslow just tried to murder him over a face full of mashed potatoes. Darcy begs Max to stop, and Patty Darbanville is good here. She really sells it, absolutely coming across as a girlfriend desperately afraid both for and of her boyfriend as she tries to talk him back from the brink. Max flees to the roof, followed by Darcy, 
who trips over Winslow's head on the way there, and that's a good stunt. I think Darbanville really kicked Dabney Coleman in the face tripping over him. On the roof, Max clings to the television aerial while telling Darcy how bad he is and how she couldn't possibly love him. She tearfully disagrees, saying that if she didn't love him, she wouldn't be there with him, on the roof, scared out of her wits. Darcy thinks that's love, but it's more likely a form of Stockholm Syndrome due to Max's manipulative, narcissist behavior, and frankly, I think even if he hadn't gotten his powers, this same scenario would have someday played out anyway, only with him on a bridge or holding a firearm. Anyway, he gets struck by lightning, somehow conveniently transferring his powers to Dorita via her television and an off-screen lightsaber, apparently. Max and Darcy have their final kiss, enjoying the sunrise, while Dorita immediately embraces her new telekinetic powers by doing housework. Of course. Wait a minute. The film's climax started out with dinner and ended with the sunrise. So either they had dinner at around 3 in the morning, or the climax of the film occurred over the course of 10 or more hours. The sun was still up as everyone was getting ready, but it was dark while they were dining, which implies dinner was just after sunset, but the pacing felt like no more than a few hours passed. The timeline here doesn't make a lot of sense. What strikes me most about modern problems is how tone deaf it is when viewed through the lens of modern sensibilities. The director clearly meant for Chase's Max character to be lovable and sympathetic, yet almost everything he says and does throws up red flags that even 1980s audiences should have recognized. Perhaps it's viewing the film after the Me Too movement and all the high-profile cases of rich and powerful men getting their comeuppance after a lifetime of sexist and manipulative behavior, but none of the contemporary reviews I could find mentioned Max being a disturbing stalker. Instead, they focused more on the lack of funny moments in the film or how boring all the characters were, especially Max. Boring, but never creepy. This isn't a film like Blazing Saddles, which despite the subject matter, can still be enjoyed by modern audiences because of how clearly it satirizes racism and isn't simply displaying racist humor. Modern problems, on the other hand, can't really be enjoyed by audiences mature enough to appreciate how all too easily toxic relationships of decades past were forgiven. In other words, if you're an adult watching this film and finding yourself more sympathetic with Max rather than the long-suffering Darcy, I would really hate for my daughter to meet you. Or for anyone to meet Chevy Chase either. Thank <laughs> you.